In the fast-paced game of Yu-Gi-Oh, there are so many ways to win. Some focus on building a ton of negates and floodgates, the same way a sadistic monster might play with their food before they eat it. Some opt for explosive removal and board clears to watch their opponent's defense before loading glass cannons. And that's also neat. Tons of spells, monsters, and extra deck creatures contribute to these strategies. But what's missing? Well, trap cards that have to be set a full turn before activation. The best ones can be activated from the hand to circumvent this downside. The worst ones are on this list. We're kicking off this list with the card, The Paths of Destiny. This trap card debuted in the TCG in August of 2006 set, Power of the Duelist, and is a cornerstone card of Warrior Digrepher's saga of card lore. Similar to Felinor Monster Warrior of Zera, Digrepher's story is a branching one, with different paths he can take and ends that he can meet. The paths, you might call them, of destiny. This trap is as unpredictable as the start of any journey. It might help you, it might hurt. Let's take a look at the effect. In the grand tradition of many cards that are just not very good, you'll have to break out the coins, because both players are flipping one. Heads, and the player gains 2,000 life points. Tails, and that player loses 2,000 life points. If favored by fate, the Paths of Destiny can inflict a 4,000 life point deficit upon your opponent. But that's only one outcome. That 4,000 life point difference could benefit your opponent. Or you might both gain life, or burn together. The reason we're including the Paths of Destiny on this list, and not other cards like Gift Card, which has the effect to increase your opponent's life points by 3,000 with no games of chance, is because even if that effect isn't often useful, it is predictable, and therefore easier to build into a cohesive strategy. In fact, the best use case for both Gift Card and the Paths of Destiny is in a strategy called Nurse Burn, where a board state is created that will cause your opponent's life point increases to hurt them instead. This was accomplished using Dark Lord Nurse Refugial, a level 4 Dark Fairy with 1400 attack and 600 defense, and most importantly, a passive effect to transmute your opponent's life point increases into damage instead. This card is also kind of cool because its name is Lucifer backwards, which thematically ties into the mechanic inverting effect. Even Dark Lord Morningstar, who is a more direct incarnation of Lucifer, uses one of the Fallen Angel's titles. Back to the strategy though, Bad Reaction to Samochi is a continuous trap card that has a similar effect to blanketly reverse life point gains. Under these two cards, Path of Destiny will always deal 2,000 points of damage to your opponent, but you will still have a chance to take 2,000 points of damage too. And the thing is, dealing 2,000 guaranteed damage with Nurse Burn decks is good, but there are a few other cards that can do this a bit better without taking any damage yourself in the process. So unless you want a card that randomly has a chance to make you take 2,000 points of damage, like maybe a Cyanide Storm deck, this card's random nature is just not useful outside of anything but a Nurse Burn deck, which makes it easily the best worst card on this list. And at number 9, we have Fine, the card not the adjective. Fine is not fine. Fine is very bad. And its effect is very simple. Discard two cards from your hand. It's actually so bad that this entry is kind of a challenge. What more is there to say? Well, many cards work best in the grave. So yeah, you could use fine to effectively discard something like Bacon Saver, or dump the Blue Eyes Tuners or something. But that's not really the best way to use it. There are just so many better, specific, and general ways to relocate cards from your hand or deck to the grave. And not only are all of them better than Fine, they're also not traps, which is a big part of what makes Fine so bad. Let's look at Infernities. This archetype of Dark Fiends, used by Kaelin Kessler, following his Dark Rebirth in the Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds anime, can only access their powerful, and sometimes degenerate, effects when the player has no cards in their hand. The deck is full of creatures with nightmare-worthy designs, but an Infernity player's worst nightmare is having a hand choke with cards that they can neither get rid of nor play. In this scenario, having Fine Set could help empty the hand so the Infernity player can start looping their ridiculous combos. But not really. This card is a joke. It has to sit face down on the field and for a turn before it can activate. Meaning you'd be better off running just about anything else. Or even other delayed hand reduction cards that will at least net you some initial benefit. Like Into the Void which lets you draw one to drop your hand during the end phase. Fine has a bad effect that can become fine in niche decks. But being unable to immediately activate really bites what little application this card might have. The best argument for using Fine is probably in a dedicated Dark World deck, which is an archetype of Dark Fiends that have strong effects when discarded by card effects. But even then, it's slow and imprecise. And you've got way better options that do the same thing. And then some, and then some more. If you want Fine's effect, there's virtually no situation in which there's not another card that works better. And this isn't even a case of power creep over time. The Cheerful Coffin is a spell card that lets you discard up to three cards from your hand. And it released the TCG's second set Metal Raiders way back in 2002. 
It's like Fine in that it can trigger your Dark World effects, but way better because you can activate it without waiting a turn and you can choose how many to discard, if any. If you only have one card you want to discard, Fine is going to force you to drop another card. If you only have one card in your hand, you'll have to wait for your next draw phase to activate Fine. The Cheerful Coffin also came out six years before Fine, which didn't release in the TCG until 2008's Phantom Darkness set. Still, because of this card's hypothetical usability in Dark World decks, it only gets spot number nine. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. One very difficult trap card to activate and resolve. Why would you ever run the number eight spot on this list, Terra Firma Gravity? Answer, for the lulls and probably no other reason. It's one of those cards meant to embody a monster's signature move, like Dark Magic Attack, Burst Stream of Destruction, Infernal Fire Blast, and a bunch of others. Many of those others belong to members of the Elemental Hero archetype, because a lot of the OG crew fall into the awkward space of being both very mid and highly visible staple cards of anime protagonists. Jaded Yuki, the Elemental Hero's duelist favorite monsters, are mostly normals that you mostly wouldn't use. So the signature move cards add a little bit of pizzazz. Does Burst Return justify the use of Elemental Hero Burst in Atrix? Not really, but the artwork is cool. Clay Charge, a signature move for Elemental Hero Clayman, and Edge Hammer, a card for Elemental Hero Blade Edge, were actually in the running for the spot, but were just marginally more useful than Terra Firma Gravity, even if all of these cards are pretty much dead draws. Clay Charge and Edge Hammer both at least let you pop a monster, which is good, and Clayman can be brought out by generic normal monster support like Unexpected Die, if for some reason you're dead set on using Elemental Hero's signature move trap card. But Terra Firma Gravity? Probably not your first pick. Probably your last. It can only activate during your opponent's battle phase while you control Elemental Hero Terra Firma. And then, all of their low-level monsters are forced, if able, to attack it. It's cool how the effect embodies the narrative of the card. The planetary hero's gravity is too strong for monsters below a certain power level, and they get pulled in. But the effect is too complicated for its own good. You're not even guaranteed to survive all the battles. Terraforma gravity isn't even worth it if you could activate it, and let's face it, you can't. Because when are you going to summon an element to hero Terraforma? Let's talk about this guy. He's a level 8 earth warrior that can only be fusion summoned and has the effect to tribute another element to hero monster to gain its attack until the end phase, which can be repeated as many times as you've got the resources for. On top of its boss monster's standard initial stat line of 2500 attack and 2000 defense, it's possible that you can get a pretty bulky Terra Firma ready to swing for a game. One might notice that he looks a little similar to a different Elemental Hero with 2500 attack and 2000 defense, Elemental Hero Neos. This is probably because while Neos wasn't introduced as Jaden's ace monster until season 2 of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX anime, Jaden's counterpart in the GX manga had Terra Firma as his ace monster from the start. In fact, in the manga, Neos doesn't even exist. This might seem a bold departure from the source material, but after the original Duel Monsters manga and anime, subsequent Yu-Gi-Oh! series for both were developed at the same time, often resulting in diverging stories, cards, and characters. Anyways, like a mirror of Neos, Terra Firma doesn't actually appear in the anime. But if Jaden did summon this fusion, he would have fused Elma to Hero Ocean and Woodsman. Woodsmen and Ocean both have effects to help you prep for Terra Firma and other fusion summons. Woodsmen can add a polymerization from your deck or grave to hand, and Ocean can bounce a hero monster from your field or grave to the hand. Unfortunately, both of these effects trigger during your standby phase, which makes them inconvenient to pull off because you likely won't be resolving them during the turn these cards are summoned. And what are the odds they'll actually stick around through an opponent's turn? Act like it's the Paths of Destiny and flip a coin. Hopefully, being a forgotten ace monster from the manga is enough to net Elemental Hero Terra Firma some casual play, because his flop signature move, Terra Firma Gravity, surely isn't. Shockingly, Elemental Hero Terra Firma does have a scant few competitive TCG placements. However, just as extra deck filler for a strategy with no need of it. Nurse Burn. Yep, a deck running both Terra Firma and a Passive Destiny placed 18th in a regional in Montreal, Canada. Not Terra Firma Gravity, though. That'd be way too far. And at number 7 on our list, we have the Pyro Clock of Destiny. Releasing into TCG more than 20 years ago in 2003's Pharaonic Guardian set, this card has a very simple effect. Move the turn counter up 1. Nothing else changes, continue to play as normal. Terra Firma Gravity might be almost impossible to activate, but if you manage to get it flipped on the field, something happens. Pyro Clock is the opposite. No special activation conditions except to just do it. Only nothing's going to happen if you do. It's the miniest one of minus ones. Are there situations where you might desire to increase the turn count with no other change? Sure. You might be working towards a final countdown victory, a card that will score you the game automatically 20 turns after you play it. So yeah, not really material. 
Sure, it can skip through a third of your total wait time against an opponent who's hiding behind Swords of Revealing Light, but wouldn't you rather have Mystical Space Typhoon or any other legions of similar back row removal instead? Even the Fortune Lady archetype with a playstyle that revolves around the passage of time doesn't benefit from Pile Clog of Destiny. During each standby phase, they gain a level and some attack points, but simply adjusting the turn counter doesn't bring the game around like passing Go and Monopoly. There's no extra standby phase here, just another number. Another card that does almost nothing in a similar way is Solomon's Law Book. This trap skips your next standby phase, which may seem worse until you recall that maintenance costs tend to require payment during the standby phase, which gives the law book few, if not many, use cases, like dodging the contract burn from the DDD spells, or dancing around the XC's material drain on number 41 Baguska, the terrible tired to peer. Pyroclock of Destiny lacks even the potential upside to skipping phases, because no phases are actually skipped, and so it loses out on even more, unable to impact beneficial time cards that rely on the standby phase, like fellow clock-based card, Clock Tower Prison. In fairness, even if Pyroclock could add a counter to Clock Tower Prison to help you achieve the sweet battle damage protection of Dreadmaster Summon, you'd be better off running Eternal Dread, which adds two turns worth of counters instead of one. Pyroclock of Destiny is so bad, this list invented a new sentence, because no one has ever said you'd be better off running Eternal Dread before. You could use this card to kind of mitigate the punch of various virus cards, but it can't prevent the initial impact so it's unlikely to swing a faltering game in your favor. And at number 6, we have Curse of the Circle. Like Power Clock of Destiny, this card is unlikely to alter a game state in any way that matters. With a little digging, you could even make an argument that it's more useless than Power Clock of Destiny, and that's what's about to happen. Let's circle back to what this card actually does. You target an opponent's monster, and then it cannot be tributed or used as a synchro material, and that's it. It can still attack and activate effects. You can still XCs and link it off. So yeah, not a lot happens with this card. But wait, doesn't Curse of the Circle have more potential upside than Power Clock of Destiny? Well, yeah. You could use it on an opponent's tutor monster to counter a synchro play, sure, and that's technically useful. But it's also not predictable. You don't know if your opponent's going to be running a synchro tribute focus strategy, and then one that's so focused they can't pivot into a link monster on top of that. Power Clock of Destiny at least is a known quantity. It's why the Paths of Destiny made into this list instead of Gift Card. Although Gift Card seems worse, consistency is vital. If you're Mad Lad who's running Power Clock of Destiny, you probably have a reason and final countdown at max copies. Presumably, there's a plan. Going into the duel with Curse of the Circle, your plan is to hope. But at least in Power Clock of Final Destiny Zerg Rush, you know what you're hoping for, and after 20 turns, minus however many you can skip, it'll happen. If your opponent isn't running synchros or trying to tribute, you'll have to wait more than 20 turns for Curse's Circle to work. You'll wait forever. Anyway, for a card that no one will ever use, Konami had to put work into censoring the OCG art for its TCG release in August of 2011's Generation 4 set. The original artwork depicted a silver pentagram filling the center of a Dark Magician's trademark Dark Magical Circle. This circle did not make it into the international release, with the entire card art changing to something busier and more generic, similar to Spellbinding Circle's design. And the similarity goes further because the OCG version of Spellbinding Circle shows a six-pointed Star of David at the center of the same Dark Magical Circle. Both of these cards were censored because of religious connotations of both icons, with the Star of David being a symbol for Judaism and the pentagram being slightly contentious. The five-pointed star has a long history of meanings associated with it across various contexts. However, in America, it's generally associated with Satanism, ignoring that in Satanic context, the pentagram or pentacle tends to be inverted with a single point facing down and two ups. As depicted on Curse of the Circle, the pentagram falls more in line with the neo-pagan context, where it tends to represent five core elements of air, water, earth, fire, and spirit. Regardless, both uses of the pentagram fall outside the beliefs of the American mainstream, especially in 2011, and would likely have generated backlash against Konami. Curse of the Circle and Spellbinding Circle kind of complement each other, and working together almost form a useful lockdown with Spellbinding Circle preventing opponent's monster from attacking or changing battle position, and Curse of the Circle further constraining the monster's escape options off the board too. It's just too bad XCs and Link Summoning are some of the easiest ways to clear monsters and go into the extra deck. And yeah, the Link mechanic didn't exist in 2011, but XC Summoning sure did, making Curse of the Circle too late to be any good. Fans of the original Dual Monsters anime are no doubt familiar with the Crush Card virus and how Seta Kaiba used it to infect and, well, crush Yugimoto's deck in their epic clash atop the spires of Pegasus' castle. Crush Card Virus is not part of this list because it's wildly good, and has seen fittingly wild amounts of competitive play. Like its real-world inspiration, the Crush Card Virus has mutated over time, with retrains like Eradicator Epidemic Virus continuing to strike fear into the hearts of duelists into the modern era. But here's the thing about aimless mutations. Some traits are strong. 
and some are weak. Sometimes you get a Radicator Epidemic, sometimes you get Ekibu Drunk Mord. The number 5 spawn this list goes to a card in Kaiba's Virus Family that does not live up to its class's fearsome reputation. We're talking about Virus Cannon. Like Kaiba's Crush card, Virus Cannon cannot resolve without fulfilling activation conditions designed to first weaken the player. In Crush Card's case, the virus first had to infect a weak monster, like Asagi the Dark Clown, before it could be released upon its host's destruction. In the case of Virus Cannon, you'll have to tribute monsters. There's no narrative to this, as when Kaiba used Virus Cannon in the anime, he didn't bother with the rules. He just used too much money for that. But there's only one Sato Kaiba, and everyone else who wants to use Virus Cannon has to pay the tribute. You can send as many monsters, but not tokens, as you'd like to force your opponent to send spells from their deck to the graveyard equal to the number of tributes, or as many spells they can if they don't have enough. This can be useful since spell cards are some of the strongest in the game, and losing access to their spells can stop an opponent's plays before it even gets off the ground. So why is this card bad? Well, let's ignore the cost for now. Clearing your own board isn't great, but maybe you're running a deck that churns out an endless quantity of monsters you don't mind sweeping into the grave. More than anything else, what makes this card so bad is that your opponent gets to choose which spells to dump from their deck. Because spells are so good, most decks run a wealth of them, and reading the board in their hand can discern which ones they might not need to further their game. Basically, Virus Cannon clears your board to let your opponent thin their deck and on an off chance of maybe making them lose something important. But that maybe is not enough to justify this card. Even if they're dropping useful spells, your opponent gets to still choose which cards to mill while thinning their deck. This card would be better if your opponent was forced to excavate cards until they found the required amount of spells before discarding to the grave, since the biggest problem here is that they get a choice. When Kaiba used Virus Can against Ishizu Ishtar during the first round of the Battle City Finals, she didn't have a choice because it just blanketly sent all her spells to the grave, or 10 in the English dub, which is still a lot. This is the only duel where Kaiba used Virus Cannon, which is a shame because it's a cool fusion of the themes of his deck. His Virus cards reflect his cutthroat and thorough nature, how he'll coldly overpower his opponents with no care for their power differential. Not just content with bashing through life points, Kaiba seeks to inflict the ultimate scorn of destroying someone's entire deck. The technological nature of the Virus Cannon speaks to his skill with technology, whether it's dual monsters or private transportations, or both, Kaiba is going to invent a cool robot because he's Seto Kaiba and he can. A thing about top 10 worst of lists is that the cards often have more anime appearances than they have competitive placements. And that trend's going to continue with number 4, a trap card called Full Salvo. Very, very generally speaking, inflicting damage to your opponent is good. Most of the time, that's how you win. So how do you take a card that inflicts damage and make it bad? Giving it an activation cost of sending your entire hand to the graveyard is one easy way. And that's what Full Salvo does. Trades your hand for a little bit of damage. 200 per card. Time for math. The starting line point value is 8,000. 200 goes into 8,000 exactly 40 times. 40 also happens to be the minimum main deck size, and therefore often the optimal number of cards a player chooses to run. This means that in order to guarantee victory off of one full salvo activation, you'd have to discard probably your entire deck. While it'd be fascinating to pull off, it's not realistic. And this card is bad. Like we talked about earlier with Fine, you could maybe have some use of this card in an Infernity deck, but it's clunky and far too rigid. Being forced to lose your entire hand without exception is more likely to do harm than good, even in a deck built around making yourself discard. And again, you're not really getting anything for it. Fittingly, the duelist to use full salve in the anime was Kaelin Kessler, the Infernity Duelist, against some henchmen called only the Giant. This is significant because this duel occurs during the showdown at Crash Town Arc, which takes place after the defeat of the Dark Signers when Kaelin Kessler is revived again, and this time fully human. Ashamed of the depths where his drive for vengeance sunk him, he flees both the main cast of Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds and himself, dueling in an old West-inspired town with self-destructed fervor. His Infernity monsters, already edgy and dangerous, begin to cut in both directions with their explosive effects, with cards like Infernity Randomizer and the currently Duel Links exclusive Infernity Doomslinger. When Kaelin was a Dark Signer, an undead harbinger of devils that dwell underneath the Earth, currently sealed by the Nazca Lines, his patron entity was Earthbound Immortal Kokupakapu. This card's Nazca line was the Giant. When Kaelin is using cards like Full Salvo that harm both himself and his opponent against his specific henchman called the Giant, it's suggestive of his inability to escape his past. He's running from himself, but can't get away because the giant is always there. And so is he. Fortunately for him, Kaelin is able to find a path forward. 
thanks to the timely intervention of the stalwart companion and former nemesis, Yusei Fudo. Kaelin is able to find meaning by rededicating his new life and cursed strength to the protection of others, remaining in Crash Town, which is soon renamed to Satisfaction Town. As a nod of appreciation to Team Satisfaction, the squad Kaelin formed in the satellite so long ago that brought together himself, Yusei Fudo, Jack Atlas, and Crow Hogan. Kaelin's use of full salvo against a giant is pretty much the best case for the card, as he activates in response to his opponent's card destruction to make his hand go down to zero to avoid drawing. He makes this tech because his opponent had summoned Illegal Keeper, an anime-exclusive card that forces your opponent to return cards drawn outside their draw phase to the deck, taking 1,000 damage for each. It's not surprising that Illegal Keeper has remained an anime-exclusive, because that's one headache of a floodgate that could make any duelist start running full salvo just so the match will end quicker. Continuing our unfortunate descent to the top of this list at number 3 is an unfortunate report. This card is so bad, it's almost comedic. Even the name is a direct reference to how bad this card is. But what are the contents of this luckless missive? A single sentence of only 8 words. Your opponent conducts their next battle phase twice. Generally, you want your opponent to have less battle phases, so it's pretty easy to see where you'd go wrong activating an unfortunate report. There's not much more to say about how bad this card is. So let's brainstorm a scenario in which it might be good for science. Evil Hero Malicious Fiend is a level 8 fire fiend with 3500 attack. It's also the ace monster of the Supreme King, the identity of Jaden Yuki when he succumbed to the gentle darkness, an expression of the negative cosmic force which gave shelter to the universe's earliest life from the zealous light of destruction. The mantle of the Supreme King refers to the gentle darkness as champion against the light, but that's not as cool as it sounds. Although it's probably silly to subject foundational forces to mortal mortality, the Supreme King's strength hinged on being a real not nice person. Anyway, Evil Hero Malicious Fiend has the effect that during your opponent's battle phase, all their monsters are turned to attack position and must attack this card if able. With 3500 attack as a starting point, that's pretty rough. With this card, you'd want your opponent to have more battle phases, but it's not enough to make an unfortunate report usable. To start, the easiest way to avoid Malicious Fiend's effect is to simply not declare a battle phase and jump straight to the end phase. Unfortunately, an unfortunate report doesn't address this, since it specifies that your opponent's next battle phase will occur twice. They can still just wait for a safer time to double their attacks. So now we need another card so your opponent can't skip their battle phase. And there are a few options. Because this list is all about normal traps, let's take a look at Battle Mania. During your opponent's standby phase, all other face-up monsters are switched to attack position and must attack this turn if able. Great, so now, assuming your opponent doesn't cycle their entire board, two battle phases are insured and Malicious Fiend is sneering menacingly at its adversary. What now? Well, we need another card to make the second battle phase useful. If your opponent has no monsters because Malicious Fiend sliced through them all, the second battle phase will be very short and uneventful, if it even happens. So we need to force your opponent's battle phase, make it happen twice, while we control Malicious Fiend and also protect your opponent's monsters from being destroyed. Okay, so now before everything else, we're making sure we've got Intrigue Shield set. This is a normal trap that equips a monster and once per turn, grants them battle immunity while in attack position. You take no battle damage from its clashes, but its protection is not passed on to your opponent. Okay, so now your opponent's monsters will be forced to attack twice, once during each battle phase, and it only took three normal traps and a fusion spell and two materials. Totally worth it. But ultimately, a situation has been created in which an unfortunate report would behoove you. This is very important work. Have you ever felt like Reload was too overpowered? Crashing down to number 2 spot on this list, we have Localized Tornado. It's like Reload, except you don't get any cards back. Anyways, this is a relatively less popular entry in the series of the atmospheric and celestial weather phenomena that clears cards from the field. However, Localized Tornado does stand above mainstream contemporaries like Mystical Space Typhoon, Twin Twisters, and Storm in one way, removing something bigger than back row. Localized Tornado shuffles your entire hand and your graveyard into the deck. The localized part of this name is probably because unlike the other cards we mentioned a second ago, Localized Tornado doesn't touch spells and traps, as long as they're on the field. Often cards that bury a significant portion of your hand into the deck let you compensate that cost with a draw or two, like Morphing Jar, Card Destruction, and Hand Destruction for example. Not full salvo of course, as we covered on this list, but Localized Tornado doesn't either. Use your hand to wave goodbye to your opponent, because they're both empty and you're getting nothing in return. Is there a way this can be good? Sure, if you're going to deck out on the next turn, or maybe you're running multiple copies of Treacherous Trap Hole, which pops two of your opponent's monsters, which can only be activated if you have no traps in your grave. This wouldn't even work in Duel Links anymore, the only place Treacherous Trap Hole is actually good, because now it's limited to one. Speaking of old strategies nerfed out of existence, in Duel Links, Teo Gardner has a skill called Surprise Present that sends a set spell or trap card from your field to your opponents. They can't see what the card is, but they can activate it, 
And back when the skill lets you use it on your first turn, passing off localized tornado and waiting for your opponent to surrender could net you wins. It wasn't foolproof. All your opponent had to do was protect themselves and not activate the mystery card. But where is the fun in that? You can win by simply playing the game or by playing the player. And who wouldn't be tempted to flip over that secret card to see what it's hiding? But as fun as that is, it doesn't make localized tornado good. It's still bad enough to land number two and only misses number one because for a time, in one format, it was part of the busted set localized tornado, gift it, pass it, and laugh when your opponent disconnects FTK. It's really convenient the previous entry on this list involves a surprise present skill because the number one pick for worst normal trap is also a gift, the gift of greed. This card's effect is very simple. Your opponent draws two cards. Like pretty much this entire list, you can construct a ridiculous game state in which giving your opponent two free cards might help you. Like if you're running a really clumsy Fable Unicorn lock where your opponent's effects are negated while you have the same number of cards in hand. Or you really need an extra 1000 attack on your Joker. Or through some anime shenanigans, you've gotten a hold of the Giants anime exclusive Illegal Keeper, which would actually turn the Gift of Greed into a top deck mill 2 that burns your opponent for 2000, which isn't half bad actually. Or real, because again, right now this card doesn't exist. The Gift of Greed actually debuted in the TCG a few months after a card from earlier in this list. Fine, with both being Rai spin-offs of the OG staple Pot of Greed, which allows you to draw two additional cards from your deck. Or three cards in VR format. But yeah, no matter how you shake it, this card makes it easier for your opponent to win. And harder for you to. Pot of Greed has been banned forever because going plus one with no conditions is too powerful. So yeah, using a slow normal trap to take your opponent to plus three, that's number one spot bad. Alright, and that's the list. There are way more than 10 awful normal traps, so if I missed your favorite, or if you have ideas for future videos just like this one, or funny ways to use the cards on this list to your advantage, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments.